Hi everyone, welcome to this Rockfest webinar. We are very happy to see so many participants for this uh, first Romino webinar. Um, we are confident that your presence will contribute to the interest of the discussion today. Please note that there will be a question period of approximately 15 minutes at the end of the webinar. So during the presentation, you can write your questions in the question box on the right hand side of your screen. So we will answer them directly in the chat or we'll answer them during the question session after the presentation, or we'll answer you by email uh, in the coming days. Um, so I'm gonna give the floor to my colleagues who have kindly agreed to speak to you about pressure meter today. Giving the presentation is Mr. Louis Marcin. Louis has been the technical expert for more than 20 years and has also been a huge contributor to the development of laboratory equipment. And uh, the second presenter will be Rene Leblois, who is the sales and marketing manager. Rene has been with Rockfest for 18 years. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the webinar. Louis, are you here? Yes, I am. Okay. Thank Hello, you Louis. very much. Hello, Olivier. Thank you for this nice introduction. So, good morning, everyone. So, uh, Today, I'm going to present you the second part of this webinar series about the pressure meter testing. During the previous session, I described the different types of pressure meters and some techniques for performing the test. Today's session covers the interpretation of the test results and the main applications. Note that rock test is above all a manufacturer. We do not pretend to be experts in the design of foundations. But our experience of, uh, in manufacturing, marketing, and using several types of pressure meters for over 50 years now has obviously allowed us to gain some experience in this field. Still, this webinar will only give you an overview of usual interpretation methods and applications related to pressure meters. Pressure meters can be categorized according to the method of insertion of the probe. We are uh, talking here about pre-board, self-boring, and full displacement, or pushed-in pressure meters, and according to the type of probe, which may consist of a, a hydraulic or an electronic probe. We can also say that there are two types of pressure meter tests. The first one, that is a standardized and that is a uses pre-board pressure meters and sometimes full displacement pressure meters and generally hydraulic probes. And a second type that is more difficult and expensive and which is performed using more sophisticated equipment, often electronic self-boring pressure meters. These types of tests do not necessarily produce the exact same results. So caution is recommended when categories of tests, design methods, but also equipment types are mixed. In North America and worldwide, the overwhelming majority of pressure meter tests are carried out following the first method. So with pre-board pressure meters, and usually hydraulic probes. This presentation will therefore focus on how the results from this first test method can be used. Note that I give at the end of this presentation the sources I refer to. So obviously I invite you to consult them for more information. There are two main approaches for using PMT results, the indirect and the direct methods. The indirect methods consist in estimating classical soil parameters from PMT test results and using them along with conventional or numerical design methods in order to better understand and predict the interaction between a given foundation and the soil. 
these methods rely on theoretical basis and refer to different constitutive soil models. Direct design methods use parameters that are specific to the PMT test in order to directly predict the behavior of a given foundation. These methods are not only theoretically based, but they are also experimentally validated. They are mainly associated with pre-board uh, testing. Both methods come with strengths and weaknesses and have applications under different circumstances. This presentation mainly refers to the interpretation and applications that are based on the results of pre-board pressure meters using direct design methods and some indirect methods. During the first session of this webinar, I explain in detail the differences in pressure meter types and, te and uh, testing uh, methods. For those interested, I suggest watching this first webinar, which should be available on the web. On this slide, we see typical results from a tricell or Menard Pro pressure meter and from a monocell Texan Pro pressure meter. The tricell is the reference worldwide, but the monocell pressure meter is more common in North America. The modulus and limit pressure produced by these equipments are generally assumed to be comparable. Recent tests performed with mono and tricell pressure meters in a control environment have shown no significant difference for the limit pressure, but caution is recommended in this regard. And uh, these tests have shown a slight difference regarding the modulus as shown on these two graphs. This difference can be estimated from the polynomial relations shown on these graphs. And now let's talk about the main parameters that can be obtained from a pressure meter test. The two most common ones are the pressure meter modulus E and the limit pressure PL. Other parameters can be also uh, determined from this test. There's the yield pressure PF or PY, the reload modulus ER, the shear modulus uh, G, and finally a creep factor N can be determined from a special creep test. The pressure meter test can also be used for estimating more conventional soil parameters like the total horizontal stresses, the undrain shear strength, the cohesion, and the angle of friction. The standardized PMT test will last about 10 minutes until reaching failure of the soil. And it is then considered as an undrain test in cohesive soils and as a drain test in cohesionless soils. We will no, now look at these parameters in more details. First, the pressure meter modulus, EP. This modulus is calculated by multiplying the slope of the pressure versus radial strain along a selected zone by one plus the Poisson's ratio. Sub-indices one and two indicate the beginning and the end of the portion over which the modulus is measured. When the pressure meter readings are expressed in terms of volume increase, we then have to use this formula, where mu is the Poisson's ratio and VM is the volume of the test cavity at, uh, at mid-test. During a pressure meter test, it is assumed that the flexible membrane expands radially in a uniform way along its length. 
For practical reasons, EP is calculated using the theory of elasticity, despite the fact that the soil is not a perfectly linear elastic material. We can see that in order to compute the pressure meter modulus, one must have an idea of the Poisson's ratio value. Typically, this one is set up at 0 0.33, and for saturated clays, a value of 0 0.45 is suggested. Alternatively, the shear modulus can be obtained with this formula. The modulus is a design parameter of great value. Since, this be, since this, uh, the behavior of any foundation can be directly related to it. However, I think it is important to keep in mind that it can be affected by several factors, like by the loading speed during the test, the level of stress and strain over which it is measured, the stress history of the soil, and the water content. The first loading modulus, E0, obtained from a pre-board PMT test, is measured over the pseudo-elastic zone or the linear portion of the curve. Typically, this portion will stretch over 2 to 6 percent of radial strain of the test cavity. Therefore, E0 is measured on a deformation range of about 1 percent. E0 represents a relatively low modulus value. This comes from different reasons, especially because it is measured over a relatively large strain, and because, contrary to the elastic theory, the soil has generally less resistance in, in tension than in compression, especially for cohesion-less soils. Louis Menard, who developed the pressure meter in the 50s, could see this when comparing predicted versus observed settlements. To compensate for that, he suggested using a rheological alpha factor, which was determined empirically, and that relates to the type of soil. This factor can be taken from this chart here. We see the values here for different types of, of soils and even for rock. The selection of a representative alpha factor is unusual, in unusual soils can be difficult. So uh, this chart here can be used for helping selecting better defined values in soils and also in rock. The pressure meter modulus can also be measured over an unload reload cycle. As shown on these two graphs, such cycle here, such cycle can be performed in different ways. Typically, it is performed within the pseudo-elastic uh, zone and sometimes repeated in the plastic zone. It can be performed in one or various steps, in strain or stress control mode, and over variable ranges. As a consequence, the unload reload modulus varies depending on how it is measured. This type of modulus is not as well defined as the first loading modulus, which is always obtained the same way as specified in the ASTM D4719 standard. So when using an unload reload modulus, it is important to specify how it was obtained and within which range. One interesting uh, feature about the unload reload modulus is that it would be less affected by the soil remolding that can take place when drilling and inserting the probe in the soil. With the development of computers and numerical simulations, many will try to use a representative modulus taken from a pressure meter test as an input for these calculations. But which values 
which value obtained from the PMT test should be used as an equivalent Young's modulus? Uh, there is no simple answer to that, uh, especially when considering that there would be a number of different modulus distributed in the soil that would vary in time and according to the stress and strain levels. Some would try to estimate a Young's modulus from the first loading modulus E0. The following correlations have been suggested for settlement calculations on footing, but the scatter could be important. Other authors suggest to uh, simply use a conservative value of one E0 in clay and two times E0 in sand. Another estimate could be done by dividing E0 by the alpha rheological factor. This would be more applicable for settlement estimates of large rafts. It is also possible to rely on the local experience and to calibrate for a specific foundation and load, the predictions of the PMT with those made with the elastic theories in order to determine a specific correlation between the pressure meter and the Young's modulus. A common practice consists in using the unload reload PMT modulus as an input for the solutions based on the elastic theory. The use of this modulus is possibly well justified, especially in cases where the soil undergoes some unloading and reloading, for instance, for retaining walls and large excavations. But the comments I made uh, about the variability of ER, depending on how it is measured, should be considered. Another special case is when a foundation is loaded in a cyclic way. Then a modulus taken from a cyclic loading might be considered as a good input. So we see that the selection of a representative modulus requires a good judgment and must be done not only considering the type of soil, but also depending on how the soil will be loaded. To add to this difficulty of using these methods based on the representative modulus values, one must keep in mind that the soil is very difficult to model. It is not uniform, perfectly elastic, isotropic or plastic material. Furthermore, the strain levels to be simulated can often be very small compared to the sensitivity of the testing equipment especially when taking into account the possible effects due to the soil remolding during the probe's insertion into the ground. But this being said, these numerical methods remain very powerful tools that can bring a valuable information, especially for analyzing complex soil structure interactions. And now let's talk about the limit pressure. PL, which is defined as the uh, pressure reached when the initial volume of the test cavity has doubled. This point is normally not reached during a test because the risk of bursting the membrane would get too important. So this point is normally obtained by extrapolation. Different methods can be used for doing that. It can be done visually, which has the advantage of giving room to the engineering uh, judgment. But the ASTM D4D 719 standard suggests to use the inverse uh, of volume method, P versus one over V, known as the upside down curve that we see here. The limit pressure is a measure of the strength of the soil. The net limit pressure, P prime L, is a parameter often used in the design, uh, in the in design calculations. It consists of the limit pressure minus the horizontal total stress at rest. 
This stress can be estimated by the initial contact pressure, POH, or by calculation, making necessary assumptions. The limit pressure, as well as the first loading modulus, is a very reliable and representative parameter. According to some authors, provided that proper drilling and testing methods are followed, PL and E0 would be representative within 10%. I would add to this margin of error the one coming from the type of pressure meter used, which, uh, as we saw earlier, can have a certain effect. The yield pressure, PF or PY, indicates the end of the linear portion of the curve. This parameter indicates that beyond this point, significant creep deformation can occur. The in-situ lateral stress is a soil parameter difficult to estimate. Different methods based on pressure meter tests have been suggested for this purpose. A method based on self-pouring pressure meter, and that we see often, is the lift-up method. Another method based on the pre-board pressure meters consists in using POH, the contact pressure uh, equivalent to the point of maximum curvature on the PMT curve. At this point, the probe would have recompressed the soil to its initial state prior to drilling. This point could be estimated using the intersection of two lines, one being the extension of the initial part of the curve and the other being the extension of the linear zone of the curve. The reliability of these methods are often questioned. One thing is sure, high quality drilling with a minimum of remolding is required. The long-term performances of foundations can be estimated using the creep factor N. This factor can be determined from a special creep test during which the pressure is maintained constant for 10 minutes and the volume variations are measured every minute. Creep tests are typically performed towards the end of the pseudo-elastic zone. N is the slope of the volume increased during the test. With this method, the evolution of the, of the secant modulus over time can be estimated with this formula here, where ET is uh, the modulus at, uh, at time t, and ET0 is the modulus at time T0, normally set at one minute. Another parameter that is often obtained from the pressure meter test is the undrained shear strength. This one can be estimated using PL with the following relation. We can see the scattered this relation here. The angle of friction can also be estimated from the net limit pressure, but roughly only, with the following relation here. In addition, it is possible to use E0, P prime L, and the ratio E over PL as general guidelines for soil identification, as shown here and here. Some correlations scattered by Brio are also presented here. But uh, uh, you must be careful with uh, considering the important scatter that we often see with these correlations. And now uh, I will talk about the uh, design methods. 
So the pressure meter test can be used for a number of applications, including for estimating the bearing capacity and the settlement of both shallow and deep foundations, for analyzing the behavior of laterally loaded foundations, for controlling uh, improve, uh, ground improvement works, and for estimating the deformation of rock mass. It can also be used for uh, retaining works, uh, road foundations, and also to a lesser extent for slope stability problems. The ultimate bearing capacity can directly be obtained from the limit pressure. And here is the formula to use, where uh, Kp is a bearing factor, which is a function of the soil type and the foundation's dimension. P prime L is an equivalent net limit pressure. And Q0, uh, Yeah, and the, and the Q0 is the total vertical stress at the foundation level. We see here that for shallow foundation, Kp is pretty close to 1. This method for determining the bearing capacity from pressure meter result is very simple. And yet, decades of use have shown how reliable it is which is not surprising considering the similarity between the failure mode of the soil underneath the foundation and around a pressure meter probe. Here we can see an example of this method. We have a one by one footing embedded 0.75 meters deep. And here we have the PMT test results. Kp is taken equal to 1.2, a conservative value in sand. And the average value of the limit pressure underneath the foundation is 800 kPa, as we can see here. And the vertical effective stress of the soil over the foundation is the volumetric weight of the soil times 0.75 meters. The ultimate bearing capacity is obtained by putting these numbers in this formula, and we obtain a value of 972 kPa. This example shows how simple and quick this method is, and yet it is very representative. This method was used for several small or large projects, which made it possible to significantly increase the allowable bearing capacities in some cities. Examples of that include the Manulife building in Toronto and several high-rise buildings in Chicago. This method can also be used for deep foundation, thanks to the work of the LPC, the French DOT, which compare for decades PMT and PI testing. This allowed to determine KP factors for different types of PIs, as we can see on this table. So the method is the same then for shallow foundations, except for the skin friction, which much which must be added in the calculations. Also, the capacity must be converted into kilonewtons or kips. So the perimeter and tip area of, of the pile must be considered as shown on this image, on these images. The skin friction must be estimated for each distinct soil layers by using PL and by referring to this table and to this graph for determining the skin friction capacity of the pile. So as an example, Let's say that we have an H pile driven in a uniform soil consisting of clay. And let's say that the PMT results gave a PL value of about 3 MPA. 
So in order to compute the friction capacity of the pile, we first determine the frictional capacity of the soil, F soil, by referring to this graph. So we take 3 MPa here and using Q1, a line here, which is for clay soils, we get a soil frictional capacity of about 50 kPa. <clears throat> then this value must be multiplied by an alpha factor that equals here 1.1 for driven H pile in clay. Finally, the result must be multiplied by the pile's side area uh, uh, to, by, the, by the perimeter to get uh, yeah, the total area of the exterior part to get the total friction capacity of the pile. Now I will describe methods for estimating the settlement from the PMT test. The first one is the Minard direct method. The second method is based on the elastic approach. And the third one, the load settlement curve method, has been suggested by Brio. The first method is based on this equation, where the first term represent a deviatoric or shear settlement. And the second term represents a spherical or volumetric settlement that takes place right underneath the foundation. Alpha is the Menard rheological factor that we have seen earlier. Q is the pressure under the footing. B0 is a reference dimension equal to one, to, I'm sorry, to 0 0.6 meter. And B is the footings width. Lambda D and lambda C represent shape factor that are obtained from this figure here. EC is the pressure meter modulus right underneath the footing within a depth equivalent to B divided by two. While ED is the uh, geometric mean or average modulus below the footing on a depth extending eight times to the footing uh, width as shown on the figure here. This method has been successfully used for over 50 years, but uh, it cannot be used in all situations. There are some exceptions. The first one being the cases of soil consisting of thin horizontal soil layers underlain by harder layers. During a pressure meter test, these harder layers will mask the effect of the softer ones. Uh, but here I'm talking in a situation where these layers are very thin, thinner than the length of the pressure meter probe. Another important exception is for large rafts on very compressive clays. This observation can be explained by the fact that the volumetric settlement then becomes important and it is better evaluated by odometer tests. Actually, the more predominant the shear def deformation over skin friction, consolidation and other elements, the more representative the settlement predictions based on the PMT will be. One challenge associated with this method consists in selecting a proper value of alpha in some unusual soils, for instance, in weakly cemented soils with high porosity. The local experience and previous correlations with building performance can then be considered for better selecting alpha. The example of this method I would like to present here is the AT&T building in Chicago from the work of Clyde Baker, who used the pressure meter with the Menard uh, methods for the design of a number of high-rise buildings in Chicago and elsewhere. In this project, the foundation consist, consisted of caissons of different sizes. Pressure meter tests uh, 
been performed down to the bedrock. We see the average values of the first loading modulus here and, uh, and here uh, of the reload modulus. The soil consisted mainly of very hard clays. The settlement predictions were done using the Menard formula I have just shown. We see here the effective modulus determination for the deviatoric settlement. This modulus is then used as an input in the first element of the settlement equation here. And we see here the second element of the equation, which represent the spherical settlement. This calculation was repeated for the two types of caisson. The settlement predictions were between 0.4 to 0.5 inches, which was in very good agreement with the observation of 0.4 inches. This example of the use of the pressure meter for, uh, for the design of high-rise buildings is one of many which show how useful this tool has become for this application. In Chicago, the pressure meter used in conjunctions with the MNR direct design rules gave a lot of confidence for mixed and complex foundation designs. The second method for the settlement estimation is based on the elastic theory. This indirect method is extensively used in soil mechanics. It is based on the equation here where I is an influence factor, nu is the Poisson's ratio, P is the average pressure at the foundation level, B is the width of the foundation, and E of the elastic modulus. As mentioned earlier, the main difficulty related with this method is the selection of the appropriate modulus value. The PMT reload modulus is often used for that. Finally, I want to mention a third method that could be used not only for estimating the settlement, but also the ultimate bearing capacity. It's the load settlement curve suggested by Brio. This method will use the results of the entire PMT curve to predict the entire load settlement curve of shallow foundation, and not just two points on that curve. This is done with, with these two relations. The first one here is used for co converting the radial expansion of the uh, PMT test cavity uh, into, uh, the, I'm sorry. The radial expansion of test cavity into settlement. The pressure read during the PMT test, designated as PP, is converted into PF, the pressure on the footing using this second relation. The gamma factor has been determined by accumulating load test and PMT test data of various soils, as we can see here. And all these factors here allow to include the influence of the footing shape, the load eccentricity, the load inclination, and the presence of a slope. The settlement of an isolated pile can also be estimated with what is called the load transfer method, which is a direct design method based on the Minard rules described earlier and also taking into account the vertical shaft deformation. For more information, the reference is given below. Now, another common application for the pressure meter test is the design of laterally loaded foundations. PY curves are often used for the design of this type of foundation. The PY curve indicates the total soil resistance at a particular depth, which is P, to the lateral displacement of a horizontal loaded pile, which is Y. 
pi is a horizontal length and p is a force per unit length of pi. These py curves can be based from the results of different types of in situ tests and are often constructed using numerical method, especially in cases where the soil is heterogeneous and when, and when the pile cross section is not uniform. The pressure meter test is a particularly good tool for constructing py curves for the following reasons. First, this test can be done in almost all types of soils and rock. It is probably the most versatile in situ test with this regard. And two, the PMT probe can be inserted in the soil the same way as the pile, uh, as the pile is. So namely by driving it for the design of driven piles or by using a pre-board PMT for drill shafts. And finally, the PMT testing is interesting because it can be, it can include cyclic loadings for foundations that will be submitted to cyclic loading. So we see that adapting the PMT test to how the foundation will be loaded may allow a better estimation of the soil foundation's behavior. Various methods based on PMT results were developed over the years among which we can cite the Athnar method and the Robertson methods. The Robertson method is simple. It consists of converting the PMT curve into PY curve by multiplying the pressure read during the PMT test by the pile's width and the radial expansion measured during the PMT test uh, to multiply it by the pile's half width. It is also possible to use approaches that are simpler than these PY curves that generally have to be developed numerically. These approaches can be considered in cases where the soil and the pile sections remain uniform with depth and they may serve as a useful check for the PY curves analysis. With these methods, several parameters will be directly estimated from the PMT test. These will include the ultimate horizontal load, the deflection at ground surface, and the pile slope at ground surface under a working load. The ultimate horizontal load, HU, is defined as the load where the soil's deflection reaches one-tenth of the pile's width. This parameter is obtained from the limit pressure using these formula, which take into account the pile's design. This parameter would apparently be rather representative as shown by pile tests performed in various soils with different types of piles as shown here. Another application for the PMT is for the control of soil improvement works. The example I want to give here is the Delta Hotel in Whistler, British Columbia. This hotel is a nine-story high building located on top of two level parkings. The soil consists of two meters of various layers of fluvial glacial materials. The geotechnical investigation, consisting of penetration tests, had revealed areas of weak penetration resistance. It was then decided to proceed to dynamic compaction as soil improvement works. Pressure meter tests were then performed before and after compaction. Typical results are shown here. These tests were successfully used not only for controlling the dynamic compaction works, but also to estimate the settlements. These were estimated to six millimeters, whereas the observed settlements were less than four millimeters.
Another interesting feature of the pressure meter test is that it can be used in other types of materials. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, I want also to say that an, a, a, another interesting uh, application for pressure meters and dilatometers or rock dilatometers is for determining the in-situ deformability of rock. Uh, these equipment are very interesting because they can quickly give an estimate of the stiffness of the entire rock mass, so including all the effects of discontinuities and in situ stresses. The measurements generated from these tests will often be used in finite element analysis for predicting the formations of tunnels, dams, foundations, and other large concrete structures. Another interesting feature of the pressure meter is that it can be used in other types of materials, including repository sites, permafrost, ice, concrete, uh, controlled modulus columns, soil cement columns, etc. A case where a rock pressure meter has been recently used uh, uh, is the example that it was used for testing soil cement columns that were built during a land reclamation project in Hong Kong. We see here the typical test results that were obtained from these tests. So, this ends this presentation which consisted only of an overview of the main application methods and applications related to pressure meters, and mainly to the pre-board ones. Overall, we have seen that the PMT tests can provide valuable information for various applications, especially for shallow foundations, or laterally loaded foundations, for high-rise buildings, for large structures on rock, for soil improvement control, and in general where undisturbed samples cannot be obtained and where other conventional in-situ tests cannot be performed. For instance, in very hard soils and in rock. Finally, I would like here to outline the fact that a number of interpretation approaches and types of PMT equipment have developed in parallel, in parallel over the years. So these ones do not always produce the exact same results. So caution is recommended when mixing the results from different equipment, te te uh, different testing techniques and interpretation methods. During this presentation, we mainly focused on, the, on those based on the commonly used pre-board pressure meters. So this completes my presentation. I hope you have enjoyed it. And here are the references that you can consult if you want. And I thank you. Louis, thank you. That was excellent. Thank you for the presentation. Um, we will now move on to the question session. Uh, so I'm going to give the floor to my colleague Ole, Sales, uh, Sales and Marketing Director at Rock Test in uh, Montreal, Canada. Ole, you are up. Yep. Thank you, Olivier. Uh, thank you, Louis, for the presentation. <clears throat> we have a lot of questions and comments. Yeah, I wish we'd be uh, in a room where we could have some discussions, but it's not the case. But let's go with a few questions. The first one is, uh, you didn't talk about the seismic applications. Why? Is it because pressure meter tests should not be used for them? Uh, no, 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 it's uh, not necessarily, uh, uh, actually I see the PMT test that it seems to be used more and more for this type of application, but still uh, this application remain rather rare for the pressure meter. Uh, I guess they, they are, there are different reasons, I, uh, probably because the pressure meter is not as common as other testing methods as CPT or the CPT, uh, but uh, 
Uh, also, the pressure meter doesn't give much information on the on the dynamic behavior of the soil. Uh, so, of course, this this is probably a reason. Uh, but I know that the pressure meter is used once in a while for sys for for these application. Uh, for instance, if a shear modulus is required, uh, the pressure meter can be used for for estimating that. Uh, and uh, uh, also, there are some correlations that were su suggested for uh, for liquefaction estimation. Uh, uh, these from from Brio, uh, Jean Louis Brio has, has. But but I think that uh, this was a bit preliminary. So more studies should be probably done in this field so but i remember one application which was for estimating the interaction between some uh, some columns that had been done uh, for, for as a ground improvement in in the soil and these columns were uh, considered as a rigid inclusion so uh, it was apparently it was important to try to estimate the effect of how these columns could interact during an, an, an earthquake with the soil. So uh, some PMT tests had been, or results had, were used for that. Uh, but uh, obviously I'm speaking here mainly for pre-board pressure meters. Uh, there might be more studies that exist based on results from self-boring pressure meters, but I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, a uh, few other questions. There's one there regarding slide 13. I don't know if you can go on slide 13. Oh boy, I can try. Ah, okay. All right, you can. There you go. Oh yeah, it's working. Slide okay, 13. so um, a few more slide 13. Oh, 13. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The the question is, uh, what do you mean by cycle modulus? Oh, oh, it's simply a modulus that is measured during a cycling test, uh, during a pressure meter test. You remember that I've mentioned that a cycle can be done, an unload reload cycle can be done, but you can repeat the cycle at the same place several times. So this information could be interesting in some applications. So that's what I meant. Okay, thank you very much. Other question? Um, any idea how many pressure meter tests should be done for a typical project? Uh, that, that's uh, the more you do, the the better, <laughs> the best, of course. But at some point, you will have some uh, financial and time limits. So uh, it depends on various factors. Uh, first, the heterogeneity of the soil. Uh, of course, if the soil is homogeneous, it's you don't, it's not necessarily to run as many tests. Uh, also depends on the application. Uh, I mentioned that for the settlement calculations, the direct design method suggests to run tests uh, down to uh, eight times the footings width. So you need to make tests down to, to this depth. Also, it depends to the tolerance to the risk. Uh, some structures are more critical than others. Uh, so I, can, I guess this could be play also in, in the decision. Uh, but one good thing about the PMT test is that the, the volume of soil that is involved during a single test is much larger than the one during a, during a lab test normally. So for, especially, uh, for instance, during a triaxial test, uh, the volume of soil that is involved is, is much smaller. So, uh, but typically a PMT test will be repeated every, about every five feet in, in the borehole until reaching the depth of influence of the foundation. So, so as you can see, it depends on different factors. Okay, uh, maybe one more, uh, time for one more. Uh, one last question. Does the settlement calculation with PMT methods include both elastic and plastic settlement? Can you repeat that, please? Yep. Uh, does the settlement calculation with PMT methods include both elastic and plastic settlement? Uh, yes, yes, but that there are there are two two approaches, as I mentioned, uh, and this is this is what is important. And there's this is what is difficult, and uh, it comes also to the to the. Uh, 
of course, when when you are designing uh, any foundations, normally you should you should remain in uh, the design should be done for remaining in the what is called the pseudo elastic zone of uh, of the pressure meter test. So uh, so uh, this is important to consider. And also, if you want, you can consider the long-term performance, as I just mentioned, using the N factor. All right, well, there's more questions, but I think we're out of time. So thanks again for your time. And for the other question will be answered later on uh, during the week or next week uh, individually. Thank you very much, Louis. Okay, it was a pleasure. Bye. Thank, thank you, everyone. So if you have any other questions, please send them at info at rocktest.com. The email is info at rocktest.com. Uh, hoping that uh, we can collaborate in future projects uh, together. So um, again, thank you very much for taking time today and showing interest in our webinar, and we look forward to hearing you very soon. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye.